Hello, everyone. Welcome to the web seminar, How LinkedIn Scaled Data Center Operations with Three Phase Power, produced by Data Center Knowledge and sponsored by Raritan. Please note that this web seminar will be available on demand for 12 months starting tomorrow. You will receive an email when the session is available for review. Also, if you have any questions for our speakers, please feel free to type them into the question box on your webcast console. At this time, I would like to introduce our speakers. Oren Thomas is an MVP and MCT and has a string of Microsoft MCSE and MCITP certifications. He has written more than 30 books for Microsoft Press IT Pro topics. He is an author at Pluralsight and is a contributing editor at Windows IT Pro magazine. He has been working in IT since the early 1990s and regularly speaks at conferences in Australia and around the world. Jawahar Swaminathan is the Director of Power Sales for Raritan Incorporated. Based in San Francisco, Jawahar works with data centers customers to design and implement optimal power distribution and monitoring systems that help reduce energy usage and improve operations. Jawahar joined Raritan in 2002 during the acquisition of Arola Systems Incorporated, a Hewlett Packard spin-off company where he headed the client software development team. Since joining Raritan, Jawahar has contributed to the firm's entry and rapid success in the intelligent energy management segment. Eric Wendorf is a staff engineer for data center services. He is a master of space, power, and cooling, has elevated LinkedIn's data center to new performance heights in three short years. The 2006 Penn State International Business grad holds certifications in DCOM, CDCM, and ITC Level 1 thermo thermography. And if that weren't impressive enough, you should know that he's also on the IDCA Technical Standard Committee, who will soon release a new data center standard that offers a holistic way to grade data centers from an application perspective. And at this time, I would like to hand things over to Oren. Hello, and welcome to this session, a bird's eye view of data center design. My name's Oren Thomas, and in this short session, I'm going to quickly give you an overview of things that you need to consider if you are designing a data center. Things such as data center cooling, cable design, fire protection, electrical design, and given what this overall seminar is about, I'll also give you a brief very brief introduction into three-phase electric power and three-phase electric power in data centers, with, of course, later speakers going into far more detail about this topic. Anyway, let's get into it. So the first thing I wanted to give you a brief overview of is really data center cooling, because if you know anything about data centers, you know that cooling is actually one of the big things that you need to take care of when you're designing a data center. One of the things you need to think about is your airflow architecture. Very early on in data center design, when people started putting big computers in, in rooms, there was a feeling that you had to keep the entire room within one degree of 68 Fahrenheit, which is around 20 degrees Celsius. Since then, we've actually come to understand the way that air should move through a data center and the ways that we can get air to move through a data center in a way that cools the equipment in a way that's appropriate, that it keeps the, the equipment running, but does so in the cheapest possible manner. And the better you manage airflow in a data center, the less energy you're going to need to expend to cool that equipment. And the less energy you spend, the less cost there is involved. And data centers are really a lot about cost. You want to reduce costs as much as possible whilst keeping everything running and reliable. So you've probably heard of this idea of hot aisles and cold aisles. In a nutshell, what you do is you organize the racks so that the front of the racks is on one aisle and the back of the rack is on the other aisle. So you position things so that the front of the racks is where air comes into the blade or into the servers in the rack. And the hot aisle behind it is where air blows out of the servers, out of the blades, into an aisle. So you position racks so that aisles are hot or cold, but they're not a mixture of both. You introduce new air into the cold aisle, and then you remove air once it's blown through the blades or the servers from the hot aisle. 
Now you can set up what's called full containment. And what full containment does is it blocks cold aisle air from entering the hot aisle, except by passing through the computers. It also stops hot aisle air from sort of recirculating into the cold aisle. Of course, setting up full containments does cost more and it complicates your access to cabinets. It's a bit more complicated to get to the blades to the service, but that gives you the best sort of airflow circulation. Now, when you're measuring the temperature in a data center, you do it from where the air passes into the rack, not when it's expelled after the cooling the components of the rack. So before it sort of gets moved out of the data center or back into a cooling area where it's returned before it's returned to the, the cold aisle. Now, another thing about data center cooling is this idea of, you know, do you go with raised floors or do you go with overhead cooling? And that really depends on your design. There's arguments either way. Raised floors certainly provide you with greater flexibility in terms of placing air distribution outlets simply because you can move your tiles and your grates around as necessary. The floors is that they do require extraordinarily careful management of air velocity. You need to make sure that cold air reaches the top of the server racks without blowing past them and wasting it. Overhead cooling, on the other hand, requires that you put all the ductwork in place before you put the cabinet layout in. It's, of course, very much easier to automate overhead cooling to adjust for the varying loads in the cold aisle. Now, in terms of free cooling technologies, at a very basic level, if you place a data center in a location where it's consistently cold, you get a lower ambient temperature air. You have to cool the air less. That means that you're spending less money cooling. Dry air is a lot better to work with because it's less energy intensive than humid air. And, you know, you can even go to the point of doing what Microsoft's done recently, which is exploring using submerged data centers where you put it so deep in the water that the natural convection of the ocean around the edge of the data center actually cools the equipment inside. One of the other things you need to think about with data center design is the kind of cabling you use. So you've got coax, twisted pair and optical fiber. Coax primarily used for wide area circuits. Twisted pair, probably something you're much more familiar with. Um, you could have, but you probably won't have seen for some time, CAT3 and CAT5. These days, we're really looking at CAT6A, which is 10 gigabit Ethernet over less than 55 meters, uh, you know, coming down to about one gigabit if you go out to uh, 90 meters. And 90 meters is a good length for that. You have with about, you know, 10 meters for patch cords. If you go below, beyond 100 meters, you get attenuation and problems. You've also got optical fiber that goes into data centers. You've got OM1, OM2, OM3, OM4. OM4 being what you'd put into a new data center gives you one gigabit ethernet over just over a kilometer. If you want to go up to 10 gigabit ethernet, you get 550 meters, which is half a kilometer. And if you want to go to 40 gigabit ethernet, you'll get that over 150 meters or 100 gigabit over 150 meters. So going forward, you're looking at uh, optical fiber OM4 for your data centers. Now, with in terms of the future of twisted pair, we've still got a future of CAT 8 or 8.1 and 8.2, which will give us up to 40 gigabits per second, up to 30 meters. So that's UTP rather than fiber optic. Now, in terms of your cable pathways, sprinklers and lighting should be placed above aisles rather than above cabinets in data center rows. Cable pathways must be designed to avoid maximum cable lengths for WAN circuits, LAN connections, and SAN connections, obviously. In terms of cabinet, rack, and cable placement, lighting and telecommunications cable should be separated by five inches. Power and telecommunications cable should be separated by at least two feet. If you have your cabling under your floor, if you've got a hot cold aisle configuration where cables are placed under access floors, telecommunications cables should be placed under hot aisles so as not to restrict airflow if underfloor cooling ventilation is used. If power cabling is placed under access floors in a hot cold aisle config, under cold aisles to ensure separation of power and telecommunications cables. Underfloor cabling should have a clearance of about two inches from the bottom of the floor. Now, if you're using overhead cables, make sure that you place cables above cabinets and racks and not above aisles. And cables in cable trays that are hanging from the ceiling should not exceed a depth of six inches. In terms of fire protection and fire in your data center, fire protection should first and foremost limit the loss of life, then downtime, then equipment and data. Sprinkler systems are life safety systems, whereas gaseous systems and 
clean agent systems are what we call equipment protection systems. Now, with increased rack power consumption density comes much higher risk of overheating. The more overheating you've got, the more chance that you have of fire. So there's a couple of ways that you can protect a data center against fire. The first is passive fire protection. That just simply means ensuring that walls, floors and ceilings are fire resistance rated. Make sure your UPS batteries can re are fire resistance rated. Make sure that you have a higher hourly rating that gives it a higher thermal resistance. Ducts, pipes and conduits should also be fire resistant. In terms of active fire protection, in the old days before the international treaties to save the ozone layer, Halon 1301 was a standard, but today is limited to the maintenance of only existing locations. Some locations have sprinklers. Now, water is often used when a data center facility is located with other occupancies, such as offices. But several things to consider with sprinklers. If you've seen Hollywood movies, they all seem to turn on at once. That is not how it happens. Sprinklers are activated thermally and only activate one at a time. So if one sprinkler activates in a room, it doesn't mean that every sprinkler in the room activates. You may need to put sprinklers in accessible interstitial places and you need to consider when you're putting sprinklers in how water will drain after the sprinklers have been activated. Another option rather than strictly sprinklers is water mist. You can use it in cabinet suppression. It uses a third less water than sprinklers but of course it's got water which means it's likely to cause irreversible damage to electronic equipment. Of course if you've got it in a cabinet and a cabinet catches fire basically the mist will stop the fire in the cabinet rather than spreading to all of the other cabinets in the data center. You've got clean agents. Now clean agents are non-conductive and non-toxic concentrations of a chemical that are designed to suppress fires and they totally flood a defined volume. So basically what you get is you get a bit of foam or something like that. It's a one shot approach and if it doesn't suppress the fire then you do need another approach because you can simply fire off the clean agent, it fills the data center or it fills the room or it fills the area but if that doesn't work well you're going to have to find another way to put out the fire and it must fill 95% of the design concentration within 10 seconds. If it doesn't do that it's not going to be effective. Hydrofluorocarbon were used. They did require as much agent as halon but are now legal. However, one of the problems with using hydrofluorocarbons to put out fires is it can, if the fire is too hot or it doesn't work properly, create acidic hydrogen fluoride which can cause damage and you know chemical problems. You've then got inert gases such as inogen. It suppresses fire through oxygen depletion. Now if you've ever worried about you know this inert gas coming in and killing people instantly by suffocating, it actually does give people enough time to egress of the area without asphyxiating and it doesn't break down into hazardous components but it does require a really great volume and pressure to suppress a fire. You've also got suppression at the cabinet level. Not only the water mist that I was talking about but things such as CO2 flooding and what it does is it floods the cabinet with CO2 but it's a one shot. If it doesn't work you're going to need to go and put another solution in place. In terms of your overall electrical design, you need to think about things like uptime. For example, how much downtime can the facility incur and how long should the facility be able to operate if the external electricity provider is offline for an extended period? In terms of uninterruptible power supplies, you have several models that you can use to deploy these. You can have what's called the parallel redundant UPS model. And basically that's if you've got three UPSs, each shares one third of the load. If one fails, the two remaining UPSs split the load 50-50. Or you've got the block redundant UPS model. When you do this, you have, say, four UPSs. Three of them function as normal carrying load and then you've got one redundant UPS which basically comes online if one of the existing UPS has failed. In terms of renewable energy it's really good when you can use it but I'll give you a, a word of warning from Australia. Just the other week we have a state called South Australia. South Australia's got a really big dependence on wind energy and they had extremely strong winds that actually meant that all of their wind energy needed to be shut down otherwise the great big windmills were going to basically tear themselves to pieces. So the state actually lost power entirely because they were so dependent on wind energy making up part of the grid. So while renewable energy can be very useful you need to plan for it with your electrical design. Okay let's talk about three-phase electric power. Now three 
phase electrical power means you've got three alternating current voltages separated by what's called a third of a cycle or 120 degrees. Basically, the voltage on any conductor reaches its peak one third of a cycle after one of the other conductors and one third of a cycle before the remaining conductor. A standard AC power, for example, is single phase and only has two conductors, one is which is phase and the other is neutral. Three-phase electrical power provides constant load suitable for equipment such as computers and motors. The real big benefit is that it provides greater amounts of power over smaller and cheaper wires. That's three times as much power over one and a half times as many wires. Now, when you think about three phases in the data center, and of course, the next speaker is going to go onto that in some detail, remember that your data center power requirements are always growing. In the past, a nine server rack consumed approximately five kilowatts. Today, you'll have a rack taking up the same space with 50 to 60 blades consuming approximately 30 kilowatts or six times as much. Now three phase power provides 1.7 times more amps per cable run from the source than standard alternating current. Anyway, what I'm going to do now is pass it on to Jawaha, who's going to speak in much more detail about three phase power in data centers. Good morning, everyone. Although I can't hear you all, I'm sure you're all excited, as excited I am, to be here with my good friend Eric Wendorf from LinkedIn and Oren from Data Center Knowledge. My name is Jawahar. A special shout out to Ashley for working hard on my name. It's not an easy one and you got it. So today we are talking about three phase power in our data centers. Pretty much every data center has three-phase power. The only question then is, until where do you have three-phase power? Is it up to the floor PDU, the RPP, or all the way to the racks? Now let's look at one of the most compelling reasons why many of us consider bringing three-phase power all the way to the rack. So the question is, why three-phase power at the racks? because it gives us a very efficient and cost-effective way to effectively double our rack densities without doubling our cost to do so. In the illustration here, we can see how with the same 30 amps rating, we almost doubled the number of servers deployed in a rack with three-phase power. If we make the jump all the way to 415 volts three-phase, we quadruple it. Now I'll turn it over to Eric from LinkedIn to share his insights on the same. Yes, thank you, Javar. So what does three-phase power mean for LinkedIn? The three key outcomes from leveraging three-phase power at the racks are scale, savings, and uptime. You all may have heard the terms web scale and hyperscale before. But what it all boils down to at the end of the day is simply scale. It is your ability to grow. But not, not just growing larger, you also need to be able to do more work within your existing footprint. Scale leads us into savings. By leveraging three-phase power at the racks, LinkedIn has significantly driven down our cost per member, or cost to serve as we call it, by allowing higher per cabinet kilowatt densities and therefore more compute in the footprint. Three-phase power at the racks also gives you a more resilient power distribution chain to support your IT equipment. But increased resiliency doesn't have to be the only benefit. By also leveraging smart PDUs, LinkedIn is actively monitoring our IT loads, and with outlet level metering, it gives us the power of smart deployments, the ability to maintain phase balancing, and it also helped us to achieve the Uptime Institute's Efficient IT Award for our new facility in Hillsborough, Oregon. As I mentioned, three-phase power has allowed us to scale and increase our densities. Our typical deployments went from about 32 server nodes at about 5 kilowatts per rack into the realm of 96 server nodes at about 16 kilowatts per rack. And with our next iteration, we are testing new systems that could push us into the neighborhood of 24 kilowatts per rack. We are able to do this because we know the exact wattage draw per system before it is deployed. Using the data we collect from our smart PDUs, 
we can compute the expected density of each rack before it is even bolted down. This knowledge will tell us if we need to use the standard North American 208 volt distribution or if we should be employing a 400 volt distribution setup. Once that has been decided, we then select the proper amperage rating for our NRAC PDUs. And now Javahar will go further into 208 volt versus 400 volt distribution. Thank you, Eric, and congratulations again on the well-deserved award. When it comes to three-phase power at the racks, as Eric mentioned, we do have two design choices in the United States. The most common one is the 208 volts three-phase, which is essentially 480 volts three-phase stepped down all the way to 208 volts. The newer standard that I alluded to is the 415 volts three-phase that our international audience would be very familiar with. Every time volts get stepped down, we lose some energy. Simply by using the laws of physics, stepping it down just to 415 volts, we save up to 3% in energy costs by eliminating transformational losses. Moving to 415 volts is a big decision. And if we are not ready for it, 208 volts three phase presents and choices in itself. Delta versus Y. I don't know about you, but the Delta versus Y that we are all familiar with does not always always help in that decision. So we're not going to see that today. Instead we're going to look at the same question of delta versus y from our needs perspective. Are all our servers and switches, take? do they take 208 volts, or do we have a need for 120 volts at the racks? In other words, do we have any legacy devices that still require 120 volts power and cannot operate at 208 volts? If the answer is yes, then we go with three-phase Y circuits because that's the only way you're going to have a neutral line in the data center and provide 120 volts by wiring line to neutral along with 208 volts in the same data center by wiring it line to line, sometimes even on the same strip as we see one here. Now, if we don't need 120 volts and we don't have legacy devices, then the choice is simple. We can avoid having a neutral and save the cost of copper, which could be significant. We can't talk about three-phase power without discussing the importance of balancing the three phases. And I'll turn it over to Eric to share some of his experiences on that. So now to break this down into a real-world scenario. This illustration is meant to demonstrate how single-phase and three-phase power work at the rack level. Here we have six racks, all supplied with single-phase power. You have a primary source from line one and a secondary from line two in the cabinet on the left, lines two and lines three in the next cabinet, and so on. In a typical 120-volt single-phase setup, this 20-amp PDU each line can support about two kilowatts. So for failover and redundancy purposes, we say this cabinet as a whole should not exceed the capacity of either input source. In this configuration, you are forced to watch your phase balancing upstream at the floor PDU or RPP level. When you move to three phase power, it is like you are consolidating three of these cabinets into one. For a typical three-phase 208-volt setup on 20-amp PDUs, each cabinet can now support nearly 7 kilowatts on either leg of primary or redundant feeds. Now, with all of this talk of lines and phases, there's a word of caution that really needs to be addressed. If you don't keep your load balanced across the three phases, it can and will have catastrophic consequences. For example, in a previous life, Several years ago, I worked at a data center where the facility, the facility operators tried value engineering 
by bringing in a generic maid service to perform the annual raised floor cleaning. Needless to say, this company was not used to cleaning mission-critical environments, nor had they been trained or certified to do it. One of the cleaners ended up plugging their vacuum into one of our rack PDUs, and this introduced a massive inrush of nonlinear load on that one phase feeding that particular outlet. This caused a cascading failure that brought down the UPS, causing an outage to one of the sources of power for the entire data floor. While this might, not, or while this might seem like an outlier, and believe me, it never happened there again, it doesn't take such dramatic events to have a similar impact if you are not keeping your IT loads within 20% imbalance across the three phases. Now Jawahar will explain how the three phases are used within the PDU. Thank you, Eric. And wow, that is a scary scenario. What makes it more interesting is the fact that when a server draws power from a 208 volt circuit, it actually draws it from two lines as a 208 volt circuit is wired line to line, as we saw earlier. We have a small device prepared for you based on what you see here. Ashley. All right, thank you, Jawahar. If L1 is 5.5 amps, L2 is 5.2 amps, and L3 is 4 amps, what is the unbalanced load percentage? We'll give you guys about a minute to respond, and then we will go to the answers. All right, and the answer is 18%. Jawahar, back to you. All right. Thank you, Ashley. That's a very interesting mix of responses. Um, although most of you got the 18% right, there were a few responses that were pretty close. So let's take a moment to go through this. I'm sure you all had your coffee this morning, so you should be all good to go into the math. So we start with the average of the three lines. That's the first step. And we use that to find the unbalanced load per line. Then we take the maximum of the three, and that gives us our overall unbalanced load, and then we convert it into a percentage. So that's how we arrive at the correct answer of 18%. Now, the lower the number, the better. So congratulations to all of you that got it right. Now, you may ask, how do I keep track of this every day? Am I going to do this math over and over again? Luckily, our rack videos keep track of the unbalanced load for you, and it can even alert you when they go over a certain threshold. It's a way to figure out the right rack configuration ahead of deployment so you can altogether not worry about it once it goes in. Well, we have a calculator for that. It's a great planning tool. And I'm going to take a moment to walk through that live and switching over to my calculator screen here. Let me take a moment to show up. This is our three-phase calculator tool that's available at Raritan's website. We'll provide the link towards the end of this webinar. It has multiple tabs for each, each configuration. The tab that we're seeing here is for a three-phase AMSRAC PDU, a typical L15 or an L2130 PDU that has three breakers. Now, we have this rack configured already with a few switches, servers, and UCS in the interest of time. Now, it shows that we have still some capacity left. 
and uh, it's pretty close. So if you look at the line currents, these this PD is rated for 24 amps per line, so we are pretty close to 24 on at least one of the lines. And if we look at the breakers that we have here, all three breakers are running fine. They're rated for 20 amps each, so we are okay there. This is the line pair. And here's the balance percentage that we calculated in the exercise earlier. So we keep an eye on all these factors while we provision this rack. It's far easier to do it in a spreadsheet than in real life, plugging it in, mounting the servers, unplugging it, like Eric said, even the cabling. So let's try to add a server or two and see how that impacts the overall capacity we have. Let's say we add another pizza box. Oops that went over the line current on L1. We can do that. How about we add, let's say, a switch. It's running, well, it's actually higher. So we're pretty much maxed out there. So if we remove a UCS chassis from it, then probably we can add another couple of two U boxes. Nope, not two. Maybe one, right? So as you can see here, you have plenty of ways to adjust and, and play around with the different circuits you have. Where do, we, where do we put the devices? Is it going to be in the bottom or the middle or the top? There's a lot of decisions that you can make in the spreadsheet, in this calculator, than in real life, and make this as your work order to start provisioning the servers. So this is a simpler three-phase PDU with three breakers. Now we have the advanced ones that have six breakers on a 50 amps or a 60 amp circuit. I can also hear some of you say, okay, this is, this is all great, but where do I get these numbers from? Well, one way to do it is take the nameplate value that's provided by the server manufacturer or the switch vendor and use that as the number, I guarantee you it's not going to be in this range. It's going to be much higher, which means your servers are not going to run at that capacity all the time, but that's the maximum they anticipate ever. So if you provision your racks for the maximum ever, that means you're leaving a lot of stranded capacity at the racks. Fortunately, Eric has a better way of doing it. So I'm going to turn it over to Eric to walk us through that. That's right, Javahar. Um, as pretty much everybody knows with their BMS systems, there's thousands of data points inside a data center. Uh, and, and data is really key to managing a data center. Uh, LinkedIn has developed several internal tools to gather that data that Javahar has been talking about. So. Here you can see an example of LinkedIn's internally developed Decent tool. I've blocked out the sensitive information. This view shows one of the rows in our data center. If I click on one of the devices, for instance RU35 in the fourth rack, a details window will pop up giving tons of information about that device. For this exercise, we're interested in the model and template. If I click on the rack itself, it takes us into a cabinet view. Here you see that RU35 is mapped to Power Outlet 43. In a custom database, we store the historical draw values for each outlet, so that can then be mapped to the exact model and template associated with it. In this case, we see that a generic Cisco T C220 draws a max of about 174 watts, but this specific template, the Dash 10, only peaks out at 149 watts. So now to take those figures and plug them into Raritan's three-phase power calculator, I'm going to show you an example of the calculator that you just saw Javahar walk through. Um, but this one is configured for six breakers and the 54 outlets that LinkedIn utilizes. So when all 48 devices are the same, uh, there shouldn't be any issue. Everything's balanced. Everything's pretty much the same. 
in, in the cabinet. But what happens when we change our deployment philosophy and now there's a mix of devices in the cabinet? If I just blindly plug devices into outlets without regard, I could end up putting all like devices clustered together on one branch breaker. For example, if I were to, say, put a stack of web nodes here on this branch that all draw, say, 1.1 amps, you see that we start to get a little higher draw on lines one and two, and our phase starts to become unbalanced. And now if I were to also put maybe some storage nodes on this branch, and these draw even more, say 2.4 amps, you can see that our line current Total power are all okay. They're in the green. There's no problems. However, if you look over here, line three is out of balance by more than 20%. By simply utilizing this tool, you will see that your high power draw devices need to be spread out and you will be able to easily move them around before it gets into the field and causes a significant amount of work for the on-site technicians who will either have to run new power cables, which could wreak havoc on their cable management, or depending on your company policy, they could have to physically move around all of the devices so that they match the particular rack unit. Or even worse, if you don't catch it soon enough, the IT systems will have already been imaged and deployed, making a fix potentially service impacting. So that about wraps up um, our discussion on three-phase power in data centers and Raritan's three-phase power calculator. We hope all of this information was helpful and that you enjoyed our presentation. All right, great. Thank you to Oren, Jawahar, and Eric. As a reminder, if anyone has any questions, please type them into the question box on your screen. I see that we already have a few submitted. So let's jump right in. Our first question, is there an acceptable amount of imbalance? Yeah, I can take that. This is Jawahar, and then I'll, uh, I'll let Eric comment on it as well. So that's a great question. Uh, so what happens when there is an imbalance in, uh, in between the lines is, you know, if, if you look at a, a data center with neutral, it's easier to explain it. So when you have a neutral, the imbalance is actually going into the neutral. You're, it's essentially amounting to loss in energy. Um, so the minimal, the better. Eric has a has a guideline that's that's at 20%. Uh, there are there are instances where there are much more conservative uh, thresholds that people tend to have. It could be 15%, but the the essential point is to keep an eye on these on a on a day to day basis to make sure they don't creep up too much and you keep it as close to hundred percent all all three lines as possible. Eric, would would you like to add anything to it? Uh, really just to stress that uh, anything over 20% can start to uh, degrade your uh, your power um, train and and that you should strive to keep things under 10%. All right, great. Next question. What kinds of power information do you track? So I'll, uh, I'll jump on that one. Uh, at LinkedIn, we pretty much track every bit of data that we possibly can. Uh, we, we've got things from you know, room level, um, the, the PDU level, down to the cabinet level, uh, even down to the outlet level, as you saw. Um, we track, you know, watt, kilowatt hours, um, we track amps, we, tra we track phase imbalance. Uh, really, it, if it's a data point that we can track, we, we try to, to, to keep track of that. All right, great, thank you. Um, Eric, we have another question that's directed to you. What cost savings are you seeing by going to three-phase power? 
Uh, so direct cost savings by going to three-phase power, as I mentioned, um, really we're able to get more compute in the same uh, data center spaces. So rather than having to you know, sign new leases and new contracts and, and expand our, our data center square foot uh, footprint, you know, we're able to, to consolidate all of that compute into, into a single space. Um, you know, it, it also is more efficient and more resilient. Um, so it, it, it's really all the factors involved kind of add up to incremental cost savings that that make three-phase power the, the right choice. All right, great. And then next question, how do you track servers that are idle? So at LinkedIn, we've got a, um, a separate tool that it's another kind of back-end infrastructure that goes along with our DSIM and CMDB tools that um, it tracks really the, um, the state it, in which it, it's deployed, whether it's in production or, or if it's not, um, and you know, whether there's any traffic flowing across it. So it's not necessarily tracked uh, through the, the power strips or the PDUs or, or any of that level of stuff, it's really tracked network-wise. Ashley, if I might jump in. So uh, there, are, there are a couple of ways to do that as well. And, and uh, like Eric pointed out, some, uh, some customers do it through, through the power, some through net, some through CPU utilization, or a combination of all three. And uh, if you're doing it through power, you can see there is a there's going to be a power signature, if you will, when you run your servers at uh, when you provision your servers and uh, like we saw earlier, there's a way to find out what you anticipate that server is going to draw, and you that's your benchmark. So after that, if you see a server consistently running much below that threshold or that benchmark, then that's clearly an idling server. Now, can you just go ahead and uh, and and power it off? Absolutely not. Right? You're going to have checks and balances within your organization before you do something like that. But at least it gives you a way to catch those servers that are just doing nothing. Um, so you you get the power footprint and you see a flat line, and that that gives you an idea that something is wrong or something is ready to be. Uh, uh, powered off, and then you can correlate that with your CPU utilization curve. And if that's also a flat line, then that corroborates that, and you can make an informed decision with it. So there are multiple ways to do it, and sometimes it's a combination. Just the uh, just the amount of um, information you have would make it make a strong case for the next action you want to take. All right, thank you for the added information, Jawahar. Um, our next question, how does LinkedIn plan to integrate new technologies in the electrical infrastructure within its existing legacy facilities three to five years old? That's a great question. Uh, LinkedIn is constantly reviewing new technologies, uh, trying to build for the future, uh, you know, planning at least five to ten years out. Uh, so. Um, you know, how do we do it? We're, we're always keeping our eyes on the market, always looking for new technologies, and when we find ones that we uh, we feel deserve to be um, tested out, we, we bring them in and, and we'll throw them into kind of a lab environment to see how they really perform. All right, great, thank you. Next question, this one is for Jawahar. You talked about using high voltage power to gain efficiency by reducing transformer losses. Are there other benefits? That's an excellent question. So, yeah, higher, higher density also means less white space used. So you, you save significantly on the, the amount of data center flow that you need, so thereby so the cost adds up, uh, or the savings add up, I should say. Higher voltage uh, also mean less current, and therefore the cables are thinner, as Oren was explaining earlier. 
So thinner cables mean you have less copper in them, which also translates to uh, savings, because copper is an expensive commodity. Now the uh, the last uh, the the not so tangible or the, or the not so uh, easy to see uh, benefit is the um, is that it's easier to work with thinner cables. If you've seen these high high amperage cables that we provide on some of the 208 volts power strips, they're pretty. And imagine how you're terminating these into plugs and outlets. It's it's pretty uh, it's pretty involved and intense. So thinner cables definitely saves you saves you time and and, and effort on just cabling and bringing the infrastructure up. So there are several benefits to 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 having a higher voltage, not just the percent efficiency gain that you get. All right, great, thank you. Next question is for Eric. What is your preferred method of getting three phase to the rack, flexible whips or busway? Uh, so at LinkedIn, um, we, like I said, we, we try to test things out. We try to, to constantly be innovating and looking for the new, new and next technologies. So uh, really what, what we're looking for is the ultimate in flexibility. And for that, um, we employ a, uh, a busway system to deliver power to the racks. Uh, not only does the busway um, kind of allow us to, to have that um, tap there ready for us when we need it, um, it, it also means that we don't necessarily need to have our own, um, you know, electricians on staff on site or, or require that the uh, COLA provider, you know, assign their, um, their, their facility engineers to come help us uh, deploy new WIPs from, from like an RPP type of setup. All right, great. Our next question, how does three-phase compare to using DC power? All right, I'll, uh, I'll take a shot at it and then uh, maybe pass it to Eric to see if he has any comments to add. DC power is, uh, is a very interesting topic. Uh, we have had, as a vendor, we have had several um, requests in for DC power strips but uh, the adoption rate is very slow, although it's a, it's a highly debated topic whether DC provides uh, a much better efficiency in the data center. The, the equally debated topic is on the safety concerns of operating a DC powered data center that's not just for like telecom equipment that takes m much less power compared to a to servers. Um, so it's a it's a it's a very highly debated topic. And as a as a power power strip vendor, we are very much engaged in those. Um, but it's a, it's pretty much a question about where the market is going and how where the uh, where the um, the design and the technology evolves or how it evolves over time. Right now, we just don't see as much of an adoption on the DC side. With uh, with OCP, it's a different different question, right? You, you have a much different infrastructure that evolves in that um, in that environment, and that brings us to you know a lot more than just DC power. Yeah, to, uh, to add on to that, Jabahar, um, so with LinkedIn, um, we are currently, like I said, we're, we're constantly trying to research and develop new technologies. Um, we've got a team of our engineers that are uh, currently involved in a project called Open19, which is uh, intended to um, you know, kind of bring an open stack to the, the general data center space. It's going to fit in any 19-inch rack. Uh, in order to power all of the server bricks in the Open19 platform, um, we pretty much had to go with DC power, uh, but we're leveraging a DC power shelf in the cabinet um, and, and plugging into existing three-phase power 
feeds from from like an existing data center setup. So um, really, you know, DC power can be useful, but it, it has specific applications, um, and it really depends on what your specific requirements are. All right, great, thank you. Next question. Since you are leasing space in Hillsboro, how does the landlord's power standards for the site impact what LinkedIn does? Um, so when we uh, set out to lease new data center space, we pretty much have an idea of what we need before we even start talking to the uh, COLA providers. So as far as the landlord's power standards for the site, um, you know, they typically provide 208 volt three phase power, uh, but when we started talking to them, we knew ahead of time that, that we needed, you know, high density, the 16 kilowatt per rack standard. Um, so we set it out as a requirement that they be able to deliver us, you know, 415 volt power to the racks. Um, so the, the power standards at the site, um, they don't really impact what we do in so much as that, you know, we tell them what we want and if they can't provide it, then, you know, we're going to have to go elsewhere. All right, great answer. Next question. Do you install the complete busway, the copper, metal, and infrastructure up front, irrespective of number of drop-downs as you expand? Uh, that is pretty much a, a yes, um, but at the same time, we plan out an entire, uh, you know, data center suite, whether it be, you know, one meg or two megs or four megs or, or however that, you know, that footprint ends up being. Uh, we plan that all out ahead of time before the, the build even, you know, begins. So uh, we have every single bit of busway uh, planned out uh, and then, um, you know, each cabinet position is covered uh, ahead of time. Now, whether we install that cabinet position, you know, that, a cabinet in that spot, day one uh, is, you know, that, that's a different story, but the busway will be there for when that cabinet arrives. All right, great, thank you. Next question. Does higher voltage in the data center mean increasing amount of RF or other interferences? That's a, that's a good question as well. It's uh, it, that is something that we have uh, we have come across, and uh, the 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 electronics in the in the power strips. I, I can speak for the power strips, and then you know uh, we can see if uh, uh, Eric has anything to add uh, in general. But yeah, as far as the power strips are concerned, we do have uh, we do have measures to protect against the uh, the increased interference. Um, these all these power strips in the U.S. are UL listed, and you will make sure that's one of the criteria for us to pass UL. Now, uh, in Europe, it's uh, it's CE, and but then in, the, in Europe, it, this has been a standard for a much longer time than in the U.S. So the when we when we talk about higher voltage, for us, 415 volts in the U.S. is considered higher voltage. Whereas in, in the international space, 415 volts is simply called three-phase because they don't have this concept of a line-to-line -to, -line to come up with 208. They always have line-to-neutral. So it's either line-to-neutral single-phase or line-to-neutral three-phase, which is also termed as 415 or 400 volts. All right, great, thank you. This next question is, data center power requirement is increasing. Are data centers adopting higher voltage or higher amps? From, uh, from what we see, this is uh, Jawahar again. From what we see, um, the, the trend is definitely higher voltage and uh, rather than higher amperage. Uh, mainly because of copper, so the electrical designers and contractors they would be they would be very much against having higher amperage if they have a cho if they have a choice of going with higher voltage um, it 's just easier on 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 everybody and also on the budget 
All right, great. This next question is for Eric and Jawahar. I am interested in moving to high voltage power. What do you recommend if you have both high and low density configurations in the same data center? Eric, why, why don't you take that first and then uh, I'll try to circle back. Uh, well, like I mentioned in, in my portion of the presentation, you know, we, we have a few different options there. If, if you know you have a high, you know, a high density need uh, and you think 400 volt power is, is right to deliver to that high density need, you can also um, step down your um, kilowatt per rack uh, by choosing a lower amperage uh, PDU feed. Um, if uh, that, that's pretty much the way we approach it at, at LinkedIn. Yeah, I was going to say pretty much the uh, the amperage part. If you if you do have 208 volts, for instance, uh, for the uh, higher density cabinets of the row, we can we can look at something like a 50 amp speed. So that's 40 amps rating at the uh, at the rack level per phase. So you have a pretty good uh, capacity built in. Like around 17 kilowatts. If you have the uh, if you have medium density or lower density uh, racks in the same same suite or same data center, then probably you can get away with like a 30 amp circuit, which gives you half of that. So it'll be uh, 8 kVA and change. So you have a good way to provide both uh, or, or provide enough capacity to both the lower capacity and high, high density uh, cabinets in the same data center. Um, there are other ways to do it, but this will keep everything in the three phase family, so you don't need to have single phase and three phase circuits running within the same data center, which could be, which could be problematic. All right, great, thank you. It looks like we have time for one more question. Let's see here. For Eric, are you, did you have any issues with cooling when increasing power capacity? Uh, so that's a really good question because um, you can't just increase your, your power consumed in the data center if you don't have the capacity to cool that extra um, draw. So we specifically haven't seen any issues with our cooling. Uh, however, uh, we did analyze the cooling capacity of the uh, mechanical equipment that feeds our space before we decided to do anything in the realm of uh, increasing our power draw, um, whether that be you know, at the cabinet level or, or even across the, the suite as a whole. All right, great, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining, but I'm afraid we've run out of time for this session. Thank you again to Oren, Jawahar, and Eric for their presentations. For more information on today's topic, please go to raritin.com. Just a reminder, this seminar will be available on demand starting tomorrow, so feel free to come back review. And thank you again for attending and have a great day.